W. B. Yeats William Butler Yeats, born in 1865 in Dublin, was a renowned Irish poet. His father was a lawyer and a well-known portrait painter. Yeats received his education in both London and Dublin, spending summers at the family's summer house in Connaught, Ireland. He was deeply involved in the Findi Siegel cultural milieu of London while actively participating in societies dedicated to the Irish literary revival. Although his first volume of verse was published in 1887, his early career was marked more by dramatic works than poetry. He collaborated with Lady Gregory to establish the Irish Theatre, later known as the Abbey Theatre, where, where he served as the chief playwright until the arrival of John Sinch. Yeats's plays often delved into Irish legends and reflected his keen interest in mysticism and spiritualism. Some of his well-known plays include The Countess Kathleen, The Land of Heart's Desire, Kathleen Ni Hulihan, The King's Threshold, and Deirdre. After 1910, Yeats's dramatic style evolved into a highly poetical, static, and esoteric form. His later plays were tailored for smaller audiences, experimenting with elements such as masks, dance, and music, while being profoundly influenced by Japanese no plays. Despite his strong patriotic sentiments, Yeats deplored the hatred and bigotry associated with the nationalist movement. His poetry often carried poignant protests against these issues. In 1922, Yeats was appointed to the Irish Senate. He is among the few writers whose most significant works were produced after receiving the Nobel Prize. While the prize was awarded for his dramatic works, Yeats's lasting significance lies in his lyrical accomplishments. His poetry, especially in volumes like The Wild Swans at Cool, Michael Roberts and the Dancer, The Tower, The Winding Stair and other poems, and last poems and plays, established him as one of the most influential 20th century English language poets. His recurring themes include the contrast between art and life, the use of mass, cyclical theories of life symbolized by the winding stairs, and the idealization of beauty and ceremony juxtaposed with the chaos of modern life. The Abbey Theatre, located in Dublin, was founded in 1904. It emerged from the Irish Literary Theatre, which was established in 1899 by William Butler Yeats and Lady Gregory, with the aim of promoting Irish poetic drama. In 1902, the Irish National Dramatic Society, led by W. G. and Frank J. Fay, took over the Irish Literary Theatre and transformed it into the Irish National Theatre Society. The society was dedicated to presenting Irish actors in Irish plays. In 1903, it was further restructured as the Irish National Theatre Society and many prominent figures of the Irish literary renaissance were closely associated with it. The quality of its productions gained rapid recognition. In December 1904, with the financial support of Annie Horniman, an Englishwoman and a friend of Yeats, the Abbey Theatre was established. The inaugural program featured plays by Yeats, Lady Gregory, and John Millington Singe, who later joined the other two as a co-director. Founding members included the Fays, Arthur Sinclair, and Sarah Allgood. The Abbey Theatre played a crucial role in promoting Irish dramatic arts and was instrumental in shaping the cultural landscape of Ireland. The Wanderings of Oisin. The Wanderings of Oisin, an epic poem written by William Butler Yeats, was published in 1889 as part of the book The Wanderings of Oisin and Other Poems. This work marked Yeats's first publication outside of magazines and quickly established his reputation as a significant poet. The poem takes the form of a dialogue between the aged Irish hero Oisin and St Patrick, who is traditionally attributed with converting Ireland to Christianity. Throughout most of the poem, Oisin recounts his extraordinary 300-year journey in the mystical lands of fairy. The narrative of the wanderings of Oisin centers around the enchanting story of the fairy princess Niam, who fell in love with Oisin's poetry and implored him to accompany her to the immortal islands. For a century, Oisin lived as one of the seed, participating in their hunts, dances, and feasts. However, his reminiscence of the Fenian Brotherhood and the mortal world left him dispirited when he discovered a washed-up spear. Niam then transported him to another island where the deserted castle of the sea god Mananin stood. There they found a woman held captive by a demon and Oisin waged repeated battles against the demon for a hundred years until it was vanquished. 
Their journey continued to an island inhabited by ancient giants who had long ago grown weary of the world and were now in an everlasting slumber, waiting for the world's end. Niam and Oisin slept and dreamt with these giants for another hundred years. However, Oisin eventually yawned to return to Ireland to reunite with his comrades. Niam lent him her horse, cautioning him not to let his feet touch the ground as doing so would prevent his return. Upon arriving in Ireland, Oisin found that his warrior companions had passed away and the pagan faith of the land had been replaced by St. Patrick's Christianity. As he wandered through the changed landscape, he encountered two men struggling to carry a heavy sack full of sand. Oisin, still a young man, bent down to lift it with a single hand and toss it away. In the process, his saddle girth broke and he tumbled to the ground, aging 300 years in an instant. This poignant conclusion reflects the profound transformation of Ireland during his absence and the inevitable passage of time. The Lake Isle of Innisfree The Lake Isle of Innisfree is a 12-line poem composed of three quatrains written by William Butler Yeats in 1888 and initially published in the National Observer in 1890. This poem, exemplifying the style of the Celtic revival, sought to create a form of poetry with distinct Irish origins, breaking away from the standards set by English poets and critics. It received critical acclaim in both the United Kingdom and France and holds the honour of being featured in Irish passports. The inspiration for this poem stemmed from Yeats's memories of his childhood, particularly his summers spent on Innisfree, an uninhabited island within Law Gill, Ireland. While walking down Fleet Street in London in 1888, Yeats was struck by a sudden memory of his youth. He vividly recalled his ambition, formed during his teenage years in Silgo, to live a life akin to Thoru on Innisfree. This island, situated in Logil, held a special place in his heart and it became the source of inspiration for the Lake Isle of Innisfree. Yeats described how this poetic creation arose from a longing for his homeland while surrounded by the bustling streets of London. His initial lyric possessed a rhythm that embodied his unique style. It marked his departure from conventional rhetoric and sought to capture a sense of individuality. Yeats cherished the idea of using everyday language and syntax, and it was within this context that Innisfree came to life. The poem is structured into three quatrains and it's a fine representation of Yeats's early lyric poetry. In this piece, the speaker expresses a profound yearning for the peace and tranquility of Innisfree while residing in an urban environment. The lines convey his desire to escape the city's cacophony and find solace in the gentle sounds of lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore. On Innisfree, he can reconnect with nature by cultivating beans and nurturing beehives. He revels in the serene purple glow of heather at noon, the whispers of birds' wings, and the soothing presence of bees. He can even contemplate building a cabin and making the island his home, reminiscent of Thoreau's simple living at Walden Pond. This poem brilliantly articulates a desire to return to nature and find serenity amidst the challenges of urban life. It ultimately explores the need for a harmonious coexistence between the inner life of the mind and the external world. The Countess Kathleen The Countess Kathleen is a verse drama penned by William Butler Yeats, written in blank verse, interspersed with lyrical elements. The play is notable for its dedication to Maud Gorn, a central figure in Yeats's life and affections over many years. Set in Ireland during a time of famine, the narrative unfolds in a historical context. The central character, the idealistic Countess Kathleen, makes a fateful decision. Driven by her profound concern for her suffering tenants who are on the brink of starvation and potentially facing damnation due to their desperate choices, she takes a drastic step. In a selfless act, she sells her own soul to the devil to secure the well-being and salvation of her people. Following the Countess's passing, her actions motivated by pure altruism and an unwavering commitment to her tenants lead to her redemption. Her soul, once in peril, is ultimately saved. As a result of her unselfish sacrifices, she ascends to the realm of heaven. The Countess Kathleen is a poignant and thought-provoking exploration of morality, selflessness and the ultimate consequences of one's actions in the face of dire circumstances. Easter 1916 
Easter 1916 is a significant poem penned by W. B. Yeats, delving into the poet's complex emotions in response to the historic events of the Easter Rising that unfolded in Ireland on April 24, 1916. The Easter Rising was a pivotal moment in Irish history, marked by an armed rebellion against British rule. Tragically, the uprising did not achieve its intended goals, and most of the Irish Republican leaders involved were subsequently executed for treason. Yeats composed this poem over the span of several months from May to September 1916. It was initially printed privately with only 25 copies in circulation and later made its appearance in magazines in 1920. However, the poem was first officially published in the collection titled Michael Roberts and the Dancer in 1921. In Easter 1916, Yeats reflects upon the very essence of heroism and its peculiar juxtaposition with the routines of everyday life. While the poem contains his contemplations on the fanaticism of the rebels and the perceived necessity of their actions, Yeats also holds an admiration for their unwavering determination. He reluctantly pays homage to their martyrdom with the recurring line, "A terrible beauty is born." The poem primarily adheres to anapistic trimeter in its meter but strategically incorporates lines with iambic measure to emphasize certain key points. The backdrop against which this poem unfolds is significant. Yeats, despite his staunch nationalist beliefs, typically advocated for non-violent means in the pursuit of Irish independence. This stance occasionally led to strained relationships with some of the key figures who ultimately spearheaded the East Rising. However, the abrupt and shocking execution of the uprising's leaders took Yeats, like many ordinary Irish people at the time, by surprise. The brutal turn of events contrasted with the initial hopes of those involved. Through Easter 1916, Yeats grapples with his emotions and reflections on the revolutionary movement and the recurring refrain, a terrible beauty is born, acquires an eerily prophetic quality. Rather than achieving the intended suppression of the revolutionary spirit, the execution of the Easter Rising leaders in reality rekindled and revitalized the Irish Republican movement, reshaping the course of Irish history. The Second Coming The Second Coming is a thought-provoking poem crafted by William Butler Yeats, first published in The Dial in November 1920 and later featured in his collection of verses Michael Roberts and the Dancer in 1921. In this poem Gates articulates his belief in the cyclical nature of history and envisions a tumultuous and ominous future. The poem, composed of two stanzas written in blank verse, employs vivid and chaotic imagery, foreshadowing a cataclysmic end of an era. Yeats himself saw this poem as a reflection of the disarray and upheaval of his time, with connections drawn to various contemporary events such as the Easter Rising in 1916, the Russian Revolution of 1917, the rise of fascism, and the political turmoil in Eastern Europe. The poem emerged in the aftermath of World War I and during the early stages of the Irish War of Independence, which commenced in January 1919 following the Easter Rising of April 1916. This was a period of unrest and transformation and Yeats penned the poem in 1919 before the British government deployed the black and tans to Ireland. Yeats initially used the phrase the second birth instead of the second coming in his initial drafts. Yeats paints a nightmarish tableau through his speaker's words. A falcon spiraling outward in a widening gyre loses contact with its falconer. The world itself is disintegrating. Things fall apart the sender cannot hold chaos and anarchy are unshackled upon the world symbolized by the blood dimmed tide and the drowning of the ceremony of innocence the speaker observes that the best individuals are plagued by doubt while the worst are fervently driven by their beliefs amid this tumultuous backdrop the speaker suggests that the revelation is imminent asserting that surely the second coming is at hand As he contemplates this notion he is haunted by an overwhelming vision of the spiritus mundi a collective spirit of humanity in the vision a colossal sphinx with the body of a lion and the head of a man moves across a desert landscape while shadows of desert birds whirl around it the speaker loses sight of this vision as darkness descends once more but he is left with the disquieting realization that the stony sleep of the sphinx enduring for two millennia has been disrupted by the motion of a rocking cradle The poem concludes with a haunting question and what rough beast its hour come round at last clouches towards Bethlehem to be born 
These lines evoke a sense of impending doom and upheaval in the face of a mysterious and malevolent force. A prayer for my daughter. The poem A Prayer for My Daughter by William Butler Yeats, composed in 1919 and published in 1921 as part of his collection Michael Roberts and the Dancer, bears a significant historical and personal context. The poem is addressed to Anne, Yeats's daughter with Georgie Hyde Lees. It was penned just two days after Anne's birth on February 26, 1919, while Yeats and his wife were staying at Thor Belly Lee during the tumultuous period of the Anglo-Irish War. At the outset of the poem, Yeats describes a storm using vivid language to convey its ferocity, symbolizing the political turmoil of the Irish War of Independence. This stormy backdrop forms the historical context within which the poem is situated. Yeats contrasts this turbulent atmosphere with his newborn daughter, who sleeps in her cradle, half-hidden, seemingly sheltered from the surrounding tempest. The second stanza establishes that the poem is set within the tower, Thor Balili, which plays a recurring role in Yeats's works. Thor Balili was a Norman tower located in Galway, and Yeats purchased it in 1917 with the invention intention of making it his home. This setting is emblematic of Yeats's connection to his homeland, and it's featured in other poems such as The Tower, published in 1928. Structurally, the poem consists of ten stanzas, characterized by a unique rhyme scheme. It begins with two rhyme couplets, followed by an enclosed rhyme quatrain. Throughout the poem, Yeats employs slant rhymes and utilizes rhythmic motifs instead of adhering strictly to syllabic patterns, making the poem more complex in terms of meter. In this intricacy, one can discern variations of metrical feet, including amphibrachic, pyrocratic and spondaic feet in stanza 2, further contributing to the poem's distinctive structure. Alternatively, the poem can also be read as iambic verse, employing common metrical techniques such as elision, acephalous lines, promotion and metrical inversions. The poem's meter thus reflects the depth of Yeats's craftsmanship and his use of rhythmical motifs which enhance the complexity of the poem. Leda and the Swan Leda and the Swan is a sonnet written by William Butler Yeats in 1923 and subsequently published in 1924. This poem is based on the Greek mythological tale of Leda, who, in the form of a swan, was raped by the god Zeus and subsequently gave birth to Helen and Clytemnestra. Yeats delves into this myth, creating a vivid and evocative narrative that captures the dramatic event and its far-reaching consequences. The poem's narrative unfolds as the speaker retells the myth of Leda's encounter with Zeus in swan form. Leda experiences a sudden, powerful impact as the great wings of the swan beat above her. The poem's imagery becomes graphic as the poem describes how the swan's dark, webbed feet carries Leda's thighs and its beak grasps the nape of her neck, pressing her helpless breast upon his breast. The sensual language creates a striking depiction of the encounter. The poem raises questions about Leda's response as it seems impossible for her vague fingers to push the swan away when it holds her between its thighs. The poem further explores how Leda's body, caught up in this intense moment, experiences the strange heartbeat of the swan, which foreshadows the consequences to come. In the final lines of the sonnet, the speaker reflects on the aftermath of the sexual encounter. A shudder in Leda's loins leads to a sequence of destructive events. The broken wall, the burning roof and tower, and Agamemnon dead. These lines refer to the far-reaching consequences of Leda's union with the swan, as it symbolically foretells the destruction and turmoil that led to the Trojan War and Agamemnon's tragic fate. The poet presents the idea that this violent act set in motion a chain of events that shaped the course of history. The form of the poem is a sonnet, a traditional 14-line poem with an iambic pentameter structure. Yeats employs a Petrarchan rhyme scheme dividing the poem into an octave and a sestet, with the pivotal moment of the swan's ejaculation marking the shift between the two sections. While Leda and the Swan is rich in mythological allusion and symbolic meaning, its enduring value lies not only in its contribution to Yeats's mystical theories, but also in its remarkable use of language to capture the intense and shocking nature of this mythological encounter. The poem artfully combines powerful action verbs with descriptive terms that underscore Leda's vulnerability, creating a sensory and emotional impact that lingers in the reader's mind. Sailing to Byzantium and Byzantium 
Sailing to Byzantium is a notable poem by William Butler Yeats, originally published in his 1928 collection, The Tower. This poem uses the metaphor of a journey to Byzantium or Constantinople to explore profound themes related to immortality, art and the human spirit. Through poetic techniques and vivid imagery, Yeats delves into the symbolic voyage of a man pursuing the quest for eternal life and his vision of paradise. The poem opens with a speaker describing the world he has left behind, a world full of youth and vitality. Nature is teeming with life, with the young intertwined in each other's arms, birds singing and fish swimming. However, the speaker laments that this world is not suitable for old men who feel neglected and overshadowed by the youthful vigour surrounding them. The speaker presents an old man as a feeble and insignificant figure akin to a tattered coat on a stick. He suggests that an old man's soul must learn to sing and to achieve this it must study monuments of its own magnificence. In pursuit of this learning, the speaker embarks on a journey to Byzantium, a city associated with art and spiritual depth. In Byzantium, the speaker addresses sages who stand in God's holy fire like gold mosaic on a wall. He implores these sages to become the singing masters for his soul, teaching it to transcend the limitations of the natural world. The speaker's heart is consumed with desire and is tethered to a dying body, which he wishes to transcend. The poem envisions a transformation where the speaker's soul is no longer bound by the natural world. He aspires to become a singing bird made of hammered gold, a symbol of transcendence and artistic beauty. This bird's purpose is to sing to both the people of Byzantium and those who belong to the past, present and future. Yeats's Sailing to Byzantium is a masterpiece of modern poetry, known for its powerful and evocative language. The poem captures the universal themes of ageing, the quest for immortality and the role of art in transcending the limitations of human existence. While it is a poetic journey to Byzantium, the poem's significance lies in its exploration of the imaginative and spiritual realm rather than a physical voyage. The form of the poem consists of four stanzas, each in Ottawa Rima, with eight lines composed in iambic pentameter. This structure adds a sense of order and balance to the poem. One of the recurring themes in Yeats's poetry is his fascination with the artificial as superior to the natural. He often portrays the artificial as unchanging and perfect, while the natural world is associated with decay and imperfection. Sailing to Byzantium is another instance of this theme, as the speaker seeks to shed the limitations of the natural world and embrace the eternal and artificial realm of Byzantium. In essence, Sailing to Byzantium is a rich and multi-layered poem that continues to invite interpretation and analysis. It offers profound insights into the human desire for transcendence and the role of art in achieving spiritual elevation. Byzantium In the city of Byzantium, the speaker sets the scene for a mystical and surreal experience that unfolds during the night. As darkness falls, the vivid and tumultuous images of the day gradually fade away, leaving behind a tranquil city. The drunken soldiers of the emperor slumber, and the sounds of night walkers dissipate with the res- resonating gong of a grand cathedral. The speaker describes a starlit or moonlit dome that looms above, emphasizing its disdain for all that is human, including the complexities and imperfections of human existence. In this ethereal setting, the speaker perceives an image, neither entirely a man nor a shade, but more simply an abstract image. The superhuman image is characterized as both death in life and life in death. A golden bird perches upon a golden tree and the speaker marvels at the spectacle, deeming it a miracle. The bird sings with resounding purity, scorning the ordinary aspects of the world, such as common birds or petals and the intricacies of human existence. As midnight approaches, the poem takes a mystical turn. Images of flames flit across the emperor's pavement, animated by an otherworldly force that does not rely on conventional fuel or materials impervious to storms. Blood-begotten spirits arrive only to dissolve into a dance, an ecstatic trance, and an agonizing flame that does not harm even a sleep. These spirits, freed from the complexities and furies of human life, arrive riding on the backs of dolphins. The poem hints at a transformative process where these spirits are shaped into the artifice of eternity, becoming ghostly images devoid of physical presence. They undergo a metamorphosis from the tumultuous sea to the golden smithies of the emperor. Byzantium is a complex and enigmatic poem that raises questions about the nature of imagery, symbolism and artistic creation. 
It is op- open to multiple interpretations with its symbolism and narrative structure offering a sense of ambiguity. The poem reflects Yeats's fascination with the artificial and the eternal even though the preference for the artificial is tinged with uncertainty. The imagery in the poem particularly the golden bird and the arrival of spirits on dolphins creates a dreamlike and surreal atmosphere. The poem's intricate symbolism and sensual language contribute to its power making it an evocative and captivating exploration of an imaginary realm. While its meaning may remain elusive, Byzantium remains a compelling work within the body of Yeats's poetry.